say thank you uh, for being here this evening and let you know that while varsity is happy to host this meeting or Village Hall, this is the meeting that is accompanied to the Environment Protection Agency. It's at their request and their public meeting for your education. So I'm going to turn it over to them. And thank you. Thank you for Good evening, everyone. I'm Cecilia Eccles, and I'm a Community Involvement Coordinator for the old Roosevelt Contaminated Groundwater Area Superfund site. I want to thank you all for coming this evening. Tonight's meeting is to address the groundwater contamination, which is part of the Honorable Unit 2. This meeting was originally scheduled for March 7th, but due to the weather, we rescheduled for tonight. So that's why the meeting is tonight. And it was also advertised in this Garden City News um, for the March 7th meeting and for the March 13th. And it was also, um, there was also an article written in the um, Newsday newspaper about this meeting tonight. Community involvement is a program designed for communities to be engaged and involved in the decision-making process during this public, public comment period, which ends on March 26. There's an opportunity for you to read through the documents that we're going to present tonight for you to weigh in on how we would like to clean up the area and hear from you all about your proposals and maybe you're in agreement with us or not. As I said, the public comment period ends on the 26th of this month. It started on February 23rd. There are three information repositories where you can receive information about this site. One is the Garden City Public Library, the second is the Hempstead Public Library, and the EPA office in Manhattan. Tonight we have several people here who may or may not speak, but I will introduce you to each person. As I said, I'm Cecilia Eccles. This is Sherelle Henry, she's the project manager. Pete Menino, he is also with EPA. He's the Western New York Remediation. Remediation Section Chief. We have Abby States. She's the EPA Risk Assessor. Leilani Davis. She is the Region 2 Attorney. Heather Bishop. She's with New York State DEC. She's a Project Manager. And John Swathward. He's with New York State DEC and he's a section chief, they're sitting in the back. EPA will present the conclusions of the remedial investigation feasibility study. EPA will present and discuss the proposed plan. There were several in the back on the table, but there is also a website you can go to to retrieve it at your leisure. And we will take all of the public comment until March 26. We will hold all of the questions till the end of Sherelle's presentation. And when you do want to ask a question, please stand up and state your name. Everything is being recorded by the stenographer on me tonight. Thank you. First Superfund Overview, 
years ago, people did not really understand how certain ways could affect our health and the environment. So what, so what happened that many ways were dumped on the ground in rivers or were left out in the open. And this resulted in um, thousands of uncontrolled hazardous waste sites. So in response to that, and because of all the toxic waste disposal disaster, Congress passed the Superfund Law in 1980. So what this law does is provide federal funding so that EPA can clean up hazardous waste sites. It also allows EPA to respond to emergencies involved in hazardous substances. And it allows EPA to compel potentially responsible parties, parties that may have been responsible for causing the problem. You know, it allows us to compel them to pay for the cleanup. So I'll go a little bit into the cleanup, the Superfund cleanup process. So the first Superfund begins when a site is discovered. And how can a site be discovered? It could be discovered by state or local agencies, by EPA, by businesses, or even by citizens like yourself. So, you know, once it's discovered, EPA make an assessment to determine, you know, do we, are we going to do early action, which if, if there is evident danger, then EPA will take an early action to mitigate that um, danger. Or is it going to be a long-term, long-term um, action? And long-term actions, you know, are done, can be, they're, they're longer and they're done in phases. So once the site is discovered, there's a scoring system that EPA uses to find out, you know, if it's if a um, if a site scores high enough, then it gets placed on the national priorities list. And basically, the national priorities list is just a list of hazardous waste sites all across the country. So for long-term actions. Long-term actions, um, you know, it's, it's an extensive process, and the first step would be um, the remedial investigation. That's where, you know, well, you, you um, have to determine where the contamination is located. So, groundwater samples are taken, soil samples, so samples of the air, just to determine, you know, what the contamination is in the various medias. So once that's done, teeth. EPA, based on the information that we find, EPA assess the risk that may, that may be, you know, that the chemical that we found may be causing. So that's called the risk assessment. And then, you know, we have to, once you, once you um, find a problem, now we have to figure out how we're going to, how we're going to address that problem. So the best portion is called the feasibility study, where you look at different alternatives Based on the contamination that you find, you find an alternative that can address that contamination. And that's the feasibility study. So the information that EPA gathers from the remedial investigation, the risk assessment, and the feasibility study, we then develop a proposed plan, which is why we're here tonight. We develop a proposed plan to let you guys know of all the alternatives that were evaluated and tell you about EPA's preferred alternatives. So once the comment period, and the comment period is usually 30 days, and once that's done and we address um, the community's comment, then a record of decision or the cleanup document, the document that you know documents the cleanup options that we are going to choose to clean up, clean up the site. So that's the record of decision. And once this, you know, the cleanup option is chosen, then now we have to design that remedy, and then, and which is the remedial, it's called the remedial design. When you design whatever cleanup option that we choose, you have to design it. And construction of that remedy is the remedial, it's called the remedial action. And for remedies, you know, once um, it's constructed, we have to make sure that, you know, you have to monitor until whatever cleanup goals are set, you monitor it until those are met. And then, you know, and so for every, in five year reviews are also conducted, you know, just every five years, if there's still, if we haven't met the cleanup goals, you, um, you want to assess to make sure that the remedy is still protective of human health and the environment. 
and the ultimate goal is to delete, to be able to delete the site from the national priority list, and so that you know it can be reused. So I'm going to give you a little site, like background. I apologize that you can't really. Um, Yeah. Stop it, commercial. Sorry, this is all. All country road. This 
is Old Country Road, so the site is, is located just south of Old Country Road. Right here, this is Clinton Road, and the site is located just to the east of Clinton Road. This is Stewart Avenue, right, located right here. And the old Roosevelt Field extends as far as, it's just it's co commercial to commercial avenue. I'm curious about how far the All right, we, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Let me just give you an idea of the layout, the layout of the site. So I'll give you a brief, brief history of the site. So from 1911 to 1946, U.S. military, that's Navy, Army and Navy, used the Roosevelt Field for aviation activities. The field was also used for as a commercial airport until 1951. So from 1951 to 1980, the area, that area that was outlined in blue, was also used for various defense and civil, civilian-related manufacturing. Um, um, these slides are going to be made available on EP, the EPA's website, so you'll be able to see it tomorrow so you can you probably don't have to take on um, the picture. So, tetrachloroethene, which is the first was TCE, and trichloroethene, which is TCE, and these, these are volatile organic compounds, and these are the, the contaminants of concern at the old Roosevelt Field site. So we believe that these chemicals were like to use during and after World War II as part of the maintenance of the um, aircrafts. In 1987, the village of Garden City installed an air stripping system to treat water from two public supply wells, which is wells 10 and 11. more recent history. In May of 2000, the site was listed on national priority list, which I did not discuss that earlier. And from 2001 to 2007, EPA conducted a investigation of soil, groundwater, and soil gas in the western portion of the site. That's the area, that's the area that's closer, closer to Clinton Road. That area, um, you know, which is, which is what we're referring to as Upper Union 1. So in September 2007, EPA selected the cleanup option for you know, Upper Unit 1. And that was groundwater extraction and treatment to restore the groundwater. And then when the water was treated, it was um, recharged to recharge basin 124 that I showed you in the previous picture. So during you know, once the ride, once the ride was signed, then we did a design and a remedial action. So to assess, you know, what was going on at the site, we put in some additional additional monitoring wells, and those monitoring wells were were installed to the eastern portion of the old Roosevelt Field Mall area, and the results from that study show that there was additional contamination that wasn't being addressed by the upper unit one remedy. So that's why we came up with upper unit two, which you know is, is um, contamination associated to the east, eastern portion of the old Roosevelt Field airfield, the former Roosevelt Field airfield. So, like I said, the the remedy for upper unit one was selected, and it's been installed. And their 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 extraction wells and extraction wells. Basically, what happened is that you know you have to extract the water from the ground so that you could pipe it underground pipe into a treatment plant. So this was done in 2010. So there are there are two six extraction wells located in the by the um, by the Garden City um. Mall. There are, three, there are three extraction wells located here, and those, you know, they, they are underground, and there are people park actually park on these um, extraction wells because they're they're in the ground, and so you, no one no one really um, sees them. The treatment the treatment plant has been in operation since 2012, 
and that's located right near the, the Village of Garden City Wells 10 and 11. And like I said, um, the remedy for the site has been in operation you know, since 2012. And there are also three additional extraction wells located in this area. And I'm not sure if when you, when you drive by, if you, would, you would notice them, but they're just to the east of the Chase, the Chase Bank. And that work was um, completed in 2012. So what happened is that the extraction well in this area wasn't addressing contamination that we found you know, in, in this area. So in 2012, EPA installed additional extraction well. And the extraction well, you know, piping was installed. And it went under, under um, Stewart Avenue and piped back to the treatment plant located on the um, Old Roosevelt Field property. So, you know, six extraction wells were installed to remove and treat contamination. And, you know, as part of the mining, you know, we have to monitor what's going on. So there's 13 multiport wells were, 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 are being used to monitor contamination at the site. And multiport wells are basically, you put one well, one well in it and you could sample at different locations, at different depths. So there's 13 multiport wells and nine single screen wells that are being sampled to monitor you know, what's going on with the you know, remedy. So now we'll talk about the OU2 remedial investigation. So like I said before, the OU, OU2 study area is located east, east of the OU1, OU1 study area. And RI activities involve evaluating existing wells to be used as part of, the, as part of um, this investigation. And groundwater screening was performed and so that we could determine the location of permanent wells. So 12 additional monitoring wells, in addition to the ones that were installed for the first, the first operative unit, 12 additional wells were installed. And two rounds of groundwater sampling was conducted, was collected. So the results of the sampling, so, so samples were taken in, you know, in different, different zones, what we call the shallow zone, which is above, anything above 250 feet below ground surface, and then the intermediate zone and the deep zone. So results for the shallow zone, and this is PC, um, tetrachloroethylene contamination. Like I said, that's one of the contaminants concerned for the site. So um, concentrations were detected up to 210 micrograms per liter. And the cleanup, um, that cleanup goal for PC would be five micrograms per liter. And the area of contamination is going towards the south, which is, is moving with the groundwater flow. So we plotted the PC and TC separately, but this is also for the shallow zone. And TC, TC was detected up to 41 micrograms per liter. And for TC, the cleanup goal was also, also five. The intermediate zone, which is where we found the bulk of the contamination for OU2. And that zone is between 250 and 400 feet below ground surface. And like I said, this is where we found the highest, the highest concentrations. PC was detected at concentration up to 600 micrograms per liter. And again, you know, contamination is flowing with groundwater, which flows to the, to the um, south. TC was, you know, of all the zones, the TC um, concentration was also higher, higher in the intermediate zone than in the other zones. But TC was not as high as the PC, and it was detected at concentration up to 120 micrograms per liter. And again, the um, cleanup goal is five.
um, contamination that was detected in the deep zone, but that's a little bit above above um, the clean the cleanup standard. And deep zone is anything greater than 400 feet below ground surface. And PC was detected at 15 micrograms per liter. PC was detected at low in a lower concentration close to the cleanup cleanup goal of five. So it was detected at seven. 7.1 micrograms per liter. So we once um, you know we collected that data, a risk assessment was done to evaluate the threat to human health and the environment. And currently there's no one drinking the, the water that we, we sampled as part of this um, study. No one is coming to drinking that water. So we evaluated future, future residents and site workers. And we, we um, and this is, if they were drinking contaminated groundwater, then they, it would present a risk. But like I said, currently, no one is drinking that water that we, that we sampled. And the cancer risk and non-cancer hazards for both the future resident and site workers exceeded EPA threshold values. And you know that's if someone if you drink if somebody came in contact with the water that we sampled in the ground, then it would present a risk. But currently, there's no one no one is drinking the, you know that water. And what level are the wells? Daniel, us from C O L E S U L E S T. At what level are we uh, pumping the water for the wells? These are, these, these the are wells that service the areas, the residential areas in that neighborhood, at what elevation or what depth? Are you talking about for your, for your, for your drinking, drinking water? water? For your drinking water, that I'm not really, um, I'm not really, I'm not really sure. I think it's below. Below the 400 feet? That, um, I'm not sure. I think that information is probably on the website. I'm not sure. I can help you out with that. Okay. The, the wells in that area are, yes, uh, Mike Flaherty, Nassau County Department of Public Works. Uh, the wells that are in that area are, are greater than 450 feet for the most part. You've got two wells in Uniondale, I think they're screening 457 to 525, something like that. And then down in Hempstead, you've also got wells that are deeper. So for the most part, they're below the intermediate zone and they're down in the uh, deep zone. And keep, keep in mind that uh, your drinking water is, is a treatment system and the water that's coming out of the well that they, you know, that distributed to people to drink, there's, there's a treatment system. And that, you know, treatment system, if there's contamination, it takes care of it. And the water that's actually being distributed meets all, you know, EPA and state, state guidelines. So people, yeah, I was just going to say, if we could just hold all the I'm questions almost, and Coach Sherrell's uh, presentation is complete, I would appreciate it. Thank you. We're almost done. The feasibility study. We have one more, one more to go. So the feasibility study actually looks at different different <coughs> options to, to clean up since volatile organic compounds. You know that's the um, contaminant of concern. So we looked at we looked at alternatives that we'd be able to, to clean up strip the volatile organic compounds. So we looked at four alternatives, but the no action alternative is required by law and it's just um, so that we have a baseline of comparison for the other alternatives. So alternative two is groundwater extraction and ex situ treatment, which is referred to as pump and treat. And this was the remedy that was selected at for upper unit one. Alternative three, in well vapor stripping which is you know air stripping but it's in, in the well it doesn't the water doesn't come above above ground. And in situ absorption, contamination is absorbed to um, carbon. So there are common elements to, to alternatives two, three, and four, there are common elements. Like they each would include institutional control. And this control would restrict anyone from you know putting a private well and come in contact with contaminated groundwater. And long-term monitoring, just to ensure 
that clean up levels in our data sheets. So alternative two, which is pump and treat. Groundwater extraction wells would be installed at a 410 feet depth, which is you know, where we found the bulk of the contamination. And this extraction well would be flush mount, so, you know, flush mount so that at um, grade, so, you know, if you can't, if you drive by, you wouldn't be able, you wouldn't be able to see it. And yard piping, which would be underground, underground piping, would then lead from the extraction well to go to a treatment, a treatment plant. And then the discharge, the, and once the water gets to the treatment plant and is treated, it would be discharged for a recharge basin, which would be located near, you know, near the extraction well. And system operation and maintenance would be would be required just to ensure that you know there is there's no problems and if there's problems, you know, we can um, fix them. Alternative three, in well stripping. So it's envisioned you know, as part of the conceptual design that we would have three extraction in injection well each at 450 feet deep. And then they would be piping back to a treatment system to treat the vapors that would be stripped from the um, from this contaminated water. And this remedy would also um, require system operation and maintenance. Upper unit four, alternative four, in situ absorption. So for this, you know, you would have injection wells in this area. So there'd be like a curtain of injection wells and groundwater would flow, as groundwater flow past these curtains, the contamination of VLCs would be adhered to the activated car carbon. And this is also done in situ. And it's envisioned that there would be approximately 47 injection wells from the conceptual design. So once there's, um, you know, you come up with a set of alternatives that can clean up, you know, the contamination that we, that we find. Then we have to compare these alternatives against EPA's nine, um, nine cleanup nine criteria for selecting cleanup plan. EPA uses these nine criteria to evaluate the various remedial alternatives which were presented in the feasibility study. So the first two criteria are what we call threshold criteria. And what this means is that EPA will not select a remedy that does not meet these two requirements. And for overall protection of human health and environment, it just answers the question, will this remedy protect you, the plant, and animal life on or near the site? And EPA, like I said, will not choose a remedy that does not satisfy this criteria. And compliance with applicable or relevant and appropriate requirements, that's a lot of words, but all it basically means is does the alternative meet all federal and state environmental statute, regulation, and requirements? And again, unless the alternative meet this criterion, then you know, EPA would not select it. The next five criteria is what we call the balancing criteria. And basically, this is a, tr a trade-off of the alternative. Like you compare pros and cons for each alternative and determine which one, which one is best. So alternative three, long-term effectiveness and permanence. Will the effects of the cleanup last? Or could contamination cause future risk? Criteria four, reduction in toxicity, mobility, and volume through treatment, which is, that's a mouthful. But basically you're answering the question, using treatment, does the alternative reduce the harmful effects of the contaminant? Does it reduce the spread of the contaminant? And the amount of the contaminant? <coughs> Short-term effectiveness, how soon Will the site receive adequately reduced? Could the cleanup cause short-term hazards to workers, residents, or the environment? Implementability is the, you know, is the alternative, is it technically feasible? Do you have 
Do you have um, the goods and <coughs> services necessary for you know for implementing the cleanup plan? You know, can you can you can you implement it? I mean, that's a that's a very important <coughs> um, criteria. And cost, you know, what is the total cost of an alternative over time? The next two criteria are what we call the modifying criteria, because basically, you know, based on input from the community and from the state, the EPA proposal <coughs> could be could be changed or, or modified. And for state acceptance, does the state environmental agency agree with the EPA? EPA proposal, and for this site that you know the, um, the state does agree with EPA's um, proposal, and community acceptance, which is the, the last criteria, acceptance of the of the preferred alternative will be assessed after the close of the comment period, which is March 26. So the cost of each of the alternative. Or there's no action, there's no action, so there's no, no cost of that one. <coughs> Alternative two, pump and treat, capital cost. The capital cost for these sites, um, if you notice that Alternative four, the upfront cost is, you know, is high, 10.7 million, whereas for the other two alternatives, they're comparable. And the total cost of the remedy, Alternative 13 front ones, they're all in, in range. Just the one that stands out is that. Capital cost for alternative four is 10.7 million. The EPA's, see we're almost done with the agenda, EPA's preferred remedy. So based on an evaluation of the nine criteria, uh, EPA choose, EPA preferred remedy is alternative two. It's a proven technology which has demonstrated effectiveness. Like I said, that was the remedy that was selected for upper unit one, for the cleanup plan from 2007. And levels of contamination based on sampling that was done, they are you know, decreasing. And this remedy would be the least disruptive to the community. There may be temporary road closures in area, areas of high traffic density, but EPA would work for the community to mitigate these impacts during the remedial design. And you know, like I said, alternatives too, you know, with the comparison of the alternatives, EPA felt that this one it met the threshold criteria and provide the best balance and trade-off among the other alternatives with respect to the five balancing criteria. So this is why on EPA preferred alternative is Alternative two. So, you know, like we said before, the comment period comments should be submitted to EPA no later than March 26, and they can be sent to address to me, or you could send the comments by email, henry.sherell@epa.gov. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. We're going to open it up for questions, and we're going to pass the mic around. Does anyone have has a question? Would you please state your name? Melissa Owen. Um, I actually have two questions. So that's okay. Um, first one is um, I live in the area with a contaminated um, site and I do grow vegetables in my backyard. Should I be concerned that I'm watering them with contaminated water? Um, I don't think, think so. Contaminated water? My own sprinklers, so the groundwater no, no, is no, contaminated. No, no, it's not, no, it's not, it's not coming, it's not coming from the groundwater. Your water is coming from the from the village of um, from even the sprinklers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, and then the second question is, who pays for this? 
the capital costs and the consumer's costs. Normally what happens is you know, we try to find potentially responsible parties, right? So far we have been, you know, we haven't been, we haven't been able to, to, you know, we're still, that process is still ongoing. We're trying to locate potentially responsible parties that can possibly pay for the site. And if you don't find them, then the super fund, you know, that law that was um, enacted, gives us the ability to use fund money to clean up, to clean up the site. So it's either PRPs, if you find any, or if not, you know, then EPA would um, would pay for it, which is what was done at um, Aquabuna 1. At the Aquabuna 1? Aquabuna 1, yes. Sure, in fact, just to add to that, yeah. um, on fund lead projects, typically EPA pays 90% of the construction cost, and New York State pays 10% uh, under an agreement they have with EPA. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Margie Wodzowski. I understand that you tested the water at various depths. Yes. Okay. Um, how is the soil? How is the air? Can I walk on the grass comfortably with my children running around barefoot? Can my pets do the same? Those are some of my concerns. Okay. Um, this, the site is an area of groundwater contamination. Right, so for upper unit one, the soil at the, the at the former um, airfield that was tested, and you know there was nothing. We didn't find anything in, in the soil. But the soil in your in your yard, you know, like I said, the site is where the where the mall is. That area that was outlined in in blue, and you know the contamination is deep. So you can you know I don't it, it wouldn't affect your it wouldn't affect you walk in, walk in the grass. Can you spell Yeah, I would just like to add something to what uh, Cheryl mentioned. So, uh, as she discussed, we do a comprehensive risk assessment that looks at potential exposure pathways uh, where people um, or the environment can be impacted by the site. The only potential completed exposure pathway for this site is for uh, future consumption of water. So currently, um, that exposure pathway is, is not complete. Uh, the village provides, has an engineered treatment system uh, for the distribution of water, and there are no other uh, exposure pathways. So what we're talking about today, and I recognize your concern, is for uh, the future potential for consumption of drinking water. That's the only completed exposure pathway um, that's at this site. Then you're telling me that everything else is safe. The soil is safe. The from from this side. From this side. Okay. From this side. Now you also you also show areas in Garden City that concern me that are very close to parks. Um, I, I would assume that that would be no worry as well then if we're saying that we don't have to worry about the air quality, we don't have to worry about the soil. It's at much deeper feet that we are to be concerned and it's the concern is the drinking water. The, the drinking of the ground of, okay. the, of the ground water. And currently no one is drinking that water. But when we do the risk assessment we have to, you know, could someone put a well in you know, we have to, you know, conserve it or anything, maybe if someone that wouldn't happen in this town below our coast. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Where, where the contamination is and where it's going. 
right? This, that's, that's the groundwater. Your drinking water is supplied by the village of Garden City. And that water, there's a treatment system on the well, so you know, that, that water you know, has, well, that really has nothing to do with groundwater. You're not drinking the water that we test, you know, that we tested as part of this investigation. The other question is, you're talking about all the fixes that you're going to do. And you outlined uh, Garden Street mm -hmm. for all those underground uh, pipe. I think going to go down Garden Street. So what, so what, what happened is that you, know, you have to come up for cost estimating purposes. You have to come up with a conceptual design. And so, you know, as part of the conceptual design, we look for areas where, you know, you maybe could place place a well. And Garden Street as a median. And you know, like I said, this is conceptual. The this could change, you know, once we get additional information. So, you know, we need to come up with a cost estimate so we have to place the well in something. And it, you know, it's going to be placed somewhere within, you know, where the contamination is found. And there's a ship. So there's a new all right. I'm sorry. It's a treatment. What we call treatment treatment building, and similar similar to what was done for Upper Unit One, the treatment plant. There's a treatment plant located, you know, right next to Garden City Supply Well, and that treatment system blends in. Like if you drove by, you wouldn't say, "Oh my goodness, look at that building in my in my neighborhood." It, it blends in with the architecture of of the you know of the area. She's gonna show a picture of it. I'm gonna try and show a picture of it. <laughs> Actually it's you Basically, I can't, you know, I'm having a problem, but if you, if you actually Google, see what you put, you do. Just Google um, the, the site name um, and put in treatment plant, and, and you'll see it. it. actually look, it looks like a, it, it looks like a house on the outside, and the treatment system is inside, it's inside the end of the building. Frank Smith, President, where are these treatment plants, these new ones, going to go? Well, so I think the simple answer to that question is, as, as Sherelle explained, the next phase of the project is called the remedial design phase. And it's during that phase of the project that we'll develop all the specifications on how the remedy will be implemented. And it's at that time that we are going to work to identify the exact location of the treatment plant, the exact location of any extraction wells, and the routing of the underground piping. As Sherelle mentioned, for planning purposes and for cost estimating purposes. Um, the feasibility study and the plan talks about a treatment plan being constructed to the east of the residential neighborhood uh, near the intersection of Grove and Garden. Um, again, park. Park. A park there. correct, in that general area. So uh, again, no final decisions have been made. Once we're in the design phase, we are going to determine where the, the, the most suitable location is for a treatment plant and work with the, um, the village uh, or the entity that owns the property to, um, to construct a treatment plant there. But so the back of this plan, which is available online also, um, shows a proposed location. Uh, again, that no final decisions have been made. It's conceptual for planning purposes. And the, uh, the extraction wells, the garden tree was chosen because it's a medium. Sorry. So, I'm sorry. the extraction wells, the garden tree was picked because it has a medium. So, that's probably the way it's well, chosen. In part. So, the extraction, right now, the conceptual design calls for one extraction well. Um, that extraction well, whether it's one or more than one, needs to be installed where the contamination is. And so, based on the data that we have, that is the most appropriate location to extract the contaminated groundwater. As I said before, during the real design phase, we're going to collect additional data, and that location may move in one direction or another. Does it draw from north uh, and south areas? So if, you're, if the extraction well is here, it's in the middle of it, does it 
draw from both ways. So typically you want your extraction well down gradient of where your contamination is. There is some influence up gradient, but it's not as much as it would be down gradient. Pulling water in the opposite direction that it naturally wants to flow. And so now to get back to your other part of your comment or question, uh, Garden Street has that medium which provides um, additional room to work and that would um, minimize the potential impact to um, the installation of the well while it's being constructed. And so um, that is an advantage of, of Garden Street, but that's not the sole reason why it's selected. It's also but there's areas that are south of Garden Street, the down downstream or down gradient. Down, will they be able to how we extract from there if it's past the extraction point? So this, the, the extraction well won't pull all of the water. The idea is that um, it will pull contamination where the volatile organic uh, compound concentrations are greater than 100 parts per billion. And so, um, when, again, when we're in the design phase, we'll figure out where it's most suited to be installed. But the, the goal of the well is not to extract all of the water out of the area. It's targets certain areas of, with the higher concentrations of contaminants. So, so in other words, if I'm at the outskirts of the outline area, how am I supposed to know how much contaminant I have? So those dotted lines, so it's not contamination that you have. That, that's in the aquifer. I, I recognize it. I believe it's right below. Yeah. So that, that depicts the contamination as we know it today, where concentrations are greater than uh, the MCL that Cheryl described, which is five parts uh, per billion. And, and, and some of that is modeled because we don't have points on every single block. And so it's, a, it's an estimated uh, based on inputs to the model. Do you, do you have the exact uh, amount of contamination that was, because the, the drill was at Garden and Boylston, um, I assume that was your drill. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I wonder what type of contamination they had right there at that well. Do we, I don't have that on my fingertips. Tom, would you know of about 400 to 500 PVP? About 400 to 500 parts right, per billion. Right there right. at Boylston and Royal. Okay. And so you keep in mind also that we are talking about contamination at significant depths. And so questions earlier um, folks had about potential exposure, you know, uh, high water tables, you, you dig in the ground, you see uh, water, that's not the water that we're talking about here. We're talking about contamination that's 200 feet or, or deeper beneath the ground. And also, wells 10 and 11, which are on the, the Superfund site itself, Garden City Village wells 10 and 11? Correct. They, why haven't they been abandoned if they're right in the school? You know, why are we still using those wells? So, I'm not in a position to answer the question as why the village is still using those wells. What I can say is that there is an engineered treatment system on those wells. In addition to other wells um, within the system and scattered throughout the island that effectively treat the contamination. Does that answer your question? Yep. Eric Sipas, S-N-I-P-A-S. You mentioned that the uh, remediation already took place on Alpha Unit 1. Now, is that complete, or does more work have to be done? Will it have to be done in the future? No, the um, treatment system was, was constructed in 2000, it's been operating since 2000, 2012. And we're, you know, we're monitoring it, and it's going to be there until the remediation goal, which is five for TC and TC. So basically it's in the, the um, long-term monitoring phase. So we, we collect samples annually and you know, to assess, make sure that the, you know, the, the remedy is, is working. And those uh, results you know, will be placed are on EPA's, will be placed on EPA's website. So as of right now, there are no plans to go back and... And, and the well, no, 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 that, that. no, no, no. It's just long-term monitoring. William Hand. My question is regarding pretty much ground zero at Roosevelt Field. Mm -hmm. With all the development that's going on there with new businesses being built there and 
hotels and restaurants and apartment buildings with the stirring up and the constant construction there and tearing up and so forth. Are you monitoring that consistently with regards to, you said things close to flow downstream? Yeah, it's not, yeah. So, so basically, is, is everything there that's being stirred up, is that being monitored? So if this is flowing downstream, is it coming down towards the southern part of you know, Garden City to the point where this is going to get progressively worse? Be worried about soil, you know, and growing and walking and playing and so forth. Is this going to be like a problem that's going to persist for the development <coughs> So I, I think the, the simple answer is no. Um, as Sherelle mentioned, um, in, after the site was listed on the NPL, we conducted an investigation uh, for what we called Operable Unit 1. And as part of that investigation, we looked at um, whether or not there was the potential for soil con contamination on the um, um, footprint of the former Roosevelt Field uh, airfield, right? And we did not find any uh, shallow soil contamination. So typically construction, you're dealing with depths of up to 10 to 12 feet, uh, give or take. And so there isn't contaminated soil um, present that um, has the potential to um, impact um, either workers or uh, anyone else uh, that's uh, downwind of, of that area. Even if when you're digging new sewer lines and waste disposal lines, Cor you're going down more than 12 feet. Uh, correct. But so... I use that uh, as an estimate, right? Um, keep in mind, the contamination that we're talking about is at depths of over 200 feet. Uh, and, and so, they're, they're based on the investigations that we've conducted prior to this second operable unit, um, we did not find um, the presence of that VOC contamination in any of the shallow soils. And uh, I would have to go back to the records to see how deep we went to, but, you know, uh, we did not stop at 10 feet, 12 feet. I use that generally for uh, construction on the island when, when someone is constructing something. And I recognize it does, can go deeper than that. Are construction crews required to report any sort of findings if they should see something while in the process of, let's say, uh, excavating? Not pursuant to any of the uh, con controls that we have in place um, from the Operable Unit 1 remedy, nor uh, for what we're proposing on Operable Unit 2. Under the OU1 remedy, uh, I apologize for using acronyms every once in a while, Operable Unit 1, there are some additional institutional controls with respect to some of the property, which um, I believe, and Lani, correct me if I'm, uh, I'm incorrect, that if the use were to change, that um, would require uh, further actions. However, um, it's with respect to property use, for example, going from commercial to residential, uh, rather than um, any disturbance. And I think if for folks who have driven down Clinton Street, you'll see that there are some um, construction activities going on, and there have been activities going on for some period of time. And um, again, there are no restrictions based on the work that we're doing here. And, uh, so, just partially uh, following that, oh, uh, Robert Foxen, uh, following this question and then another question, um, I think you're saying in terms of source control that you didn't identify the original source of the material, so there's been no uh, source control? That is correct. Could you expand on that a little bit? I'm surprised that from old maps or whatever, you really weren't able to pinpoint where the source was. So, with respect to pinpointing uh, the source, um, I believe Cheryl mentioned it earlier, the, the former airfields and the activities uh, at those former airfields that no longer are no longer present, um, we believe are the, the source uh, of the contamination. And um, as I mentioned, the data that we collected as part of the Operable Unit 1 remedial investigation did not reveal um, soil contamination uh, above uh, levels that pose uh, any kind of uh, uh, concern. So uh, I don't have that data at my fingertips. There, we, online we have all of the remedial investigation reports where we'll show exactly where each of the sampling points were and all the work that was done um, in order to try to identify any uh, source material uh, that may be remaining in the soils. Right, because you would think that if you identified the right source, <coughs> there would be residual material in the soil if you drilled them, if you sampled the right spots. 
So it sounds to me like you nobody really knows where it's coming from originally. Uh, I would dis I would disagree with that statement. Um, we believe, and as we've documented in the proposed plan, we believe the uh, former airfield hangars are the the source uh, of that contamination, and um, uh, you know the. The data um, does not reveal any uh, shallow uh, soil contamination. Okay. Beyond that, uh, uh, if it if it helps, the, the nature it's Mike Flair. Um, the nature of these sites, you have to take into account how many years are involved. So when the sources originated in the 40s and the 50s and even the late 30s, these things, these compounds migrated down through the soils. They're gone. That's why they're in the groundwater now. So those sources are the original sources created the problems that we're dealing with today, but they've actually migrated through the soils. One of the things about Long Island soils is they're really sandy. So they'll make their way down relatively easily, and then once they're gone, they're, they're right. not really... I, I understand yeah, what you're saying. saying. Usually there's some residual dean apples that are that, that adhere yeah. to the soil particles even over time. So There can be, but again, that amount of time, plus they're volatile in nature, so they want to... They want to go to the atmosphere. The other question I have, could you just explain the uh, location, the relationship, the location between the, um, the recovery wells and the uh, water supply wells? So you're asking about the existing recovery wells that have been installed as part of the... No, that, that are part of the proposed as part of the remedy versus where they're located uh, in comparison to the water supply wells. Okay, so, uh, Sherelle, could you put up the, the figure? that um, had the um, preferred alternative. Can continue to exist as it is. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. 
And then my final question is for the treatment facility itself. Um, once you make that final selection, how is the public's opinion about that choice made? Is there another hearing that we can have some input into where that selection is? Or do you just make that selection and it's fine? So we would work with the, the owner of the property in order to uh, construct that treatment plan. Uh, under the super fund process, we would not come back to the community and identify that location. However, we would work with um, the village and the immediate residents in the area um, as we uh, start to uh, firm up those plans. So you would, you would make the selection and then work with, assumedly, the village or the residents uh, about how to build it, but the site selection is yours. So, correct. Ultimately, we will identify the preferred location for the construction of the, of the treatment plan. We would then coordinate with the appropriate entities on that location in order to obtain the necessary access to construct it. And how much flexibility of yard piping here, for example, 1,600 feet, if, if that means it winds up right next to the tennis courts, right? Can, can that 1,600 become 2,600? It's a piping issue, so you could put it further back if needed. So, we weren't planning it either going into, you know, into, into the park. I mean, the location is outside, outside of the park. You know, we, we have no plan to bring it into, into the park. Right, but it could be, it could be next to it or it could be far from it. That's a choice, right? So the, the, the plant could be further away. Oh, that's my question. Okay. Um, as you move the plant further away right. from the extraction well, um, there are engineering hurdles that need to be overcome. Okay. Um, and so in an ideal situation, you'd want the treatment plant close to your extraction well, and then your discharge basin to be in close proximity. Um, however, there is the flexibility to have them further apart. And there needs to be that additional engineering measures put in place to uh, address that. Um, it, but it, it is workable. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, um, Judy uh, just with regards to the treatment plant, what kind of thing is going on? Is it noisy? Is it, like, you know, dangerous? Are there air possible risks? Can you know, waste them in the treatment system that we discussed with all the unit one? Okay. Basically, the treatment system that was constructed on the unit one. You know, once you get outside of the building, you, you don't you don't you don't hear anything. Inside the building you can, but outside you don't hear you don't hear anything. Okay. Are you just mixing chemicals with it? I mean what actually happens there to extract POCs? Um it's an air stream. And what happens volatile organic they evaporate quickly. So if you if you put air in there, it's going to um, leave water and go up into, into the air. And then that, depending on what the um, result of that is, you know, you could, you could treat it or not. And the water, once you get the VOC out of the water, then you would, you know, recharge it to, re to back, in, back into the ground. So volatile organic, they volatilize very easily. So once you become in contact with the air stripper, it strips, you know, the volatiles from, from, the, from, the, from, the, from the ground water. If I can just show everyone, this is the picture of the treatment plant on Clinton. Okay, it's a house. I wouldn't even know it's there. It's behind the woods. It fits right in pretty much. Have you ever seen it?
Why was Garden Street chosen? Is it the most specific area where the contaminant lies, or is it more convenient just for the workers? Yeah. So the the location of the extraction well is proposed based on the location of the groundwater contamination, based on the data that we have today. Um, as we collect additional information, as we go through the design phase, we will determine the most appropriate location for the extraction well. And so, um, but I, again, the, the extraction well needs to be installed, or wells need to be installed where the groundwater contamination is present. There is flexibility on the selection of the location of the treatment plant because the extractive water will be piped to that plant. And so, again, no decisions have been made, so I can't answer your question as to what side of the street. I'm sorry, you're shaking your head. Well, I'm shaking my head because the, the well that you put at the corner of Boylston and Garden was put in, because I, and it was there for quite some time. So why was that chosen there initially to be the property? Again, was it because of the location of the island in the space? Or is it just that you know that that area in the garden is going to be contaminated? So we all recognize this is a densely residential neighborhood. My preference is not to ask anyone in this room for permission to enter their property and install a well, whether a monitoring or extraction well, on your front lawn or your backyard. And so we, as a team, look at, when installing monitoring wells, where we think we will gain the best data. Okay. We then overlay that with live, real conditions and say, okay, how do we get data in this area? Because we need to install a drill, we need to have a drill rig present for several weeks, and we want to minimize the disruption to the local community. And so, based on that, then we move the, that ideal pinpoint location to the street or to a meeting or over a block. But we don't want to move it too far to the point that we aren't getting information or data that's representative of what's present. And so that is how we go about determining where we want to install a monitoring well and an extraction well. Before we go to someone else, does that answer your question or are you still? I'm just a little leery because I know you did the testing well with the corner of Boylston Garden and that's how you got your data. And I'm just curious that again, and living on that street where again you want to put it's the same area that you're doing this and I'm just curious as to why any other areas were explored other than that street would be So, if, I'm trying to figure out the, the best way to answer your question. If you're in the design phase, we collect additional data and we see that um, the extraction well needs to be in, in installed either further south west or east, or potentially north, um, we would, and if that street does not have a meeting, we would try to figure out how to install a well in that location absent the meeting. And you know, we've done this at other sites. We'll do it on the curbside. We will do it in the street. Um, we will work with folks to find the most suitable location. Um, so I think the answer to your question is, does the street was not selected because of the meeting. It was selected based on what we know with respect to the extent of contamination. And as we go through this process, the extraction well could be installed on a street that does not have a, a meeting. Does that get you further clarity on, on the process that we work with? So, Cheryl, can you put up the figure that shows um, the, the, each of the um, wells or the, the well number? Does the water travel like in the river? It is, it is. So, generally, in, in the map of the aquifer, groundwater travels in the south southwest direction. Okay. So, for each of the master wells, one here, there's one here, one here. 
Thank you. Diesel oil. Well, right. Yeah. Okay. So I, I recognize this figure uh, is, is difficult to see and it's not clear. But at, at each of these points where um, there are these black dots or these uh, green dots with values on them, those are the locations where monitoring wells have been installed. And so um, I think. Uh, Should I mention there was a total of 12, 12 monitoring wells installed as part of this effort? And so, uh, although you don't see them, although you didn't see them being installed, and um, uh, although as you drive down some of these blocks, uh, they don't stand out, um, they are there. And, and you know, I think that's it's our, our point home that when our work is done, we, we try to do it in a manner um, that is at least disruptive um, to the community. Thank you. I just have one more question. Sure, and if you don't mind, can oh, we go to the gentleman in the back who yeah. had had to ask any questions yet? Sure. Hey, hey, Tom. Can you have a microphone? I missed the mic. Hey, Tom. Tom Barton, VAOTM. Based upon previous similar projects, uh, what is the length of time for the construction? Okay. So, typically, an extraction well at this depth can take uh, approximately four to six weeks to construct. That's uh, having the drill work present and drilling to that depth and, and development. All right. The overall time frame for co uh, this construction project we're estimating to be between one to two years. And uh, that involves installing the extraction well, the piping, um, and construction of, of the treatment plant. Now. Um, Work wouldn't be occurring for that full two-year period. Work would be sequenced, and that schedule would be borne out uh, in the design uh, phase. Uh, and but right now, based on our experience, you're looking at a construction time frame of uh, between one to two years. Okay, I think the most uh, invasive part of that would be the uh, the trenches along Garden Street. In terms of that part of that phase, when I'm talking about the treatment center. But the, the well and then the, the trenching, if you will, how long would that be? So I, I, I don't I mean, have that I'm information on my fingertips, right? Like so one to two years and then no, no, no. Uh, so the trenching, I mean, that's typically work that would be uh, occur over weeks uh, up to uh, a month, month and a half time frame. It also depends on how, how that piping is installed. Uh, just as an example, for the work that Sherelle did for the first aquaboo unit, and those wells that were, extraction wells, excuse me, that were installed um, along Stewart Avenue uh, in this uh, area right here. Um, we drilled from the southern side of Stewart Avenue, under Stewart Avenue, and then piped, um, and installed piping back to the treatment plant. We were able to do that without any lane closures on Stewart Avenue by using um, directional drill. And so there's different ways that this work can be done. Um, we were going to look at that in the design phase. Um, but, you know, I think the plan is clear and we've made very clear. There will be, uh, we expect there will be disruptions uh, based on this construction related activity. And we are going to try to minimize those uh, uh, impacts to the extent that we can. Uh, Peter Marshallis, MRCH, Marshallis. Uh, just a quick question. I hope it's relevant. This is a super fun site in Beth Page. Um, what method are they using for that? Because it's kind of relevant. Uh, it's all about relevant because it's that was, I think, an air, airfield too. Where they were building. Uh, yeah, so what mean, method are they using and how effective So you're referring to the Navy Grumman site uh, in that page, right? Um, so there, um, there, uh, um, there is uh, a treatment plant uh, that uh, I believe uses a combination of air stripping and um, granular activated carbon to, to treat similar contaminants here. And so, um, here, we believe that we can treat uh, with simply um, the air stripping. However, as we go through the design phase, um, that we'll, that's when we'll know whether or not we need any additional uh, treatment capabilities uh, within that existing plan to address the contamination. But um, it's, it's similar. Yes, sir. Just 
this is a kind of a detailed question. I'm not trying to gotcha or anything. Yes. Just in case you, you don't have any idea what the groundwater flow velocity is. At this site, uh, I apologize, uh, our hydrogeologist is not here, but generally it's uh, one to two feet a day. One to two feet yeah. a day? Yeah. That's basically in the McAfee in, in Nassau County, somewhere around there. Um, but keep in mind, groundwater flow rates is different than the rate that the contamination moves. Yeah. They, they are not the same thing. Right. Okay. So, if you don't mind, that gentleman in back. Uh, Bill Bellmer, B E L O M E R. Would you put up the slide that shows the pipe on the treatment plant location? So the preferred alternative. Typically, the, I would expect that the extraction well would probably be a diameter of about 12 inches. The monitoring well, um, I believe, is, I know it's smaller than that, I'm not sure. Is it a four inch well or, or a six going down to four? But it, it is a, a smaller diameter and would not be able to be retrofitted in order to become an extraction well. And then if the extraction well is 12 inch in diameter, is that then the diameter of the pipe that goes to the treatment plant? Uh, I, I, I don't think there can be anything less than four or six inches. Um, Tom, yes, sorry. Yeah. Tom, Tom, Tom is back. How do you hear him? She needs to hear him. Oh, I'm just saying can, that can the diameter of the well goes to the treatment system. Can you have the mic? Yeah, the diameter of the, the extraction piping that goes to the treatment system is between four to six inches. What was his name? Tom is back. Tom is back. Okay. So this gentleman here had a question. So apparently, this, this EPA and everybody's known about this for quite some time, right? from the 80s and 90s, I believe. It was, it was listed in 2000. Yeah. 2000. Common sense would you say that it has affected the groundwater, the drinking water that has gotten to the aquifer. So if we're drinking it for, let's say, 420. And it's at 400. What, this might not be a question for you, but what is the town uh, purification process doing? Because I personally looked up, I have a house, uh, a system, a purification system in my house, mm -hmm. and it doesn't, 3M does not address uh, these VOCs in the, in the filter, filtration system. Area. Are there things, products out there that we can buy to, in, you know, assure that our family and our health is okay? <clears throat> so, uh, I'm not able to recommend uh, a product to you. Um, and uh, I am not going to speak for the, the village. Uh, however, um, what I can say is that um, on the village's website uh, is a copy of the annual report that, uh, that, that all um, Distributors of uh, drinking water are, are required um, to, to publish that um, show um, the uh, the results of periodic sampling that is done on those wells. Right? Um, there's a series of wells that comprise the network, and um, there's different treatment systems on uh, different wells. And I believe that information is contained in that annual report. What I want to stress is that the water distributed through that system gets treated by an engineered system that is effective 
and there is data in those annual reports to support that. Yes. My name is Robert Shelley, S-E-H-O-E-L-L-E. -E -E. Question, Mr. Swansea. Uh, Ralph, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but does the village engage the consulting engineer to work with the village on this proposed site and project? No, we have engaged an engineer. We have East Glen under contract for consultation. We haven't been assigned to this project specifically. This came up last week. Will they be in? They've, I've already called upon them for information, so we'll, we'll use them as needs to be. This is, we'll be working close to the EPA. So. H. Lynn is our water consultant and, and they'll work with us as needed. Certainly. Yeah, they're an outstanding firm. I just wanted to be sure they're on board. Yeah, we also work with DMV, Diverco Bottle Lucci. We have Diverco Bottle Lucci, DMV. We work with multiple engineering firms in this environment. Equally outstanding. Yeah. Is there a possibility that someone's going to lose their house on Grover Garden Street? Is there a possibility that someone's going to lose their house on Grover Garden Street? Well, the answer is no. But I, could you elaborate on why you think someone so has a new plan that's proposed that's going to go there? I see the area, the question of where it possibly can go. Have houses running up and down the Garden Street. The treatment plant that you want to put up, it's got to take up space. So it's, it's got to go somewhere on the Garden Street. So that's not the right the, alternative. Go to two. One. Oh, oh, it's the wrong figure. Oh. There you go. So, so let, let me provide a little further context here. To help address that. So, in a situation like this, we would not want to site the treatment plant within the residential community. We recognize that there are non residential properties to the east. And during the design phase, we are going to work with the appropriate entities to, to figure out the, the best location for that treatment plan. Right. My, in, the, in the past, uh, so for example, on an OU1, operable unit one, um, we cited the, the treatment plan in a non-residential area. And, but we designed the plan so that it would blend in with the surrounding community. It has a brick facade, the pitch on the roof matches some of the tutors that I believe are across the street. So we, my expectation is that we are going to be east of the, the residential community. Uh, today I, I can't tell you exactly which parcel we would do that on simply because we don't have, we haven't made a decision and we don't have the information. Uh, so uh, at, at this point, I don't see how that would impact a, a resident on either garden or, or growth. Well, I, I understand what you're saying about east of, what you're talking about, but east of where grocery is, is a park. Correct. Is the recharge basin, and then residences going north. To the south of it, it is a buffer zone between the street and the recharges. But with the way you were speaking before, with regards to the piping from the uh, extraction well to the treatment plant, you were trying to keep it relatively almost in a straight line, if not at a 45 degree angle, but even more so, to where it's at its end. No, so so that, there, there is no other eastern property there. So I, I would not look uh, at this uh, with respect to um, Turns or, or, or uh, degrees. Uh, so um, while we would prefer to use a, a gravity-fed system to have the, the water go from the pump that's in the extraction well up 
and over, once it's out of the extraction well, gravity fed to the treatment plant, we can, as I was talking about earlier, uh, engineer a system with additional pumps to pull that water further if we had to. So um, this is not intended to be a straight line, and um, because the extract if an extraction well were to be installed on Garden Street, that the treatment plant would need to be in a straight line with that. Uh, that's not how we work. Um, I, I, I get that. So, so if I can, just for a second, Sherelle, I think this would be helpful. If you could put up the original slide with the site overview that shows Stewart Avenue and the extraction wells and where the treatment plant is, for you want. Okay. So uh, uh, that will work. That, that, that will work. So uh, as Sherelle mentioned, we have installed three extraction wells south of Stewart Avenue in, in this general area here. Okay. Yes. We also have two extraction wells, three extraction wells, excuse me, I believe right about here. Mm -hmm. And then the treatment plant is just immediately is, is south of that, around here. I apologize. It's, it's right about there. Yeah. Okay. These wells get piped generally in this configuration. They head, yeah. they head across, well, they head down, 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 across, up, and over. So it, it's almost an upside down U, right? Or it's a, a backward C almost. And so there's an example of we didn't have a, a straight line from an extraction wall to a treatment plant. Um, and it shows you the, the distances we can travel in order to successfully pipe this material back, okay? So, um, and I recognize the concerns that are being raised um, about the location of the extraction well and the treatment plant. Um, and, I, and I hope this helps to alleviate to some degree to show the flexibility that we have with respect to um, the network to address this contamination, because here we went across, up, and over to get there. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, that that those specifics about the size of the pipe, the depth, how many turns, how it gets from point A to point B, get borne out later in the process. Right, and we are making efforts to minimize the impact to the community, right? And we are not limited by the number of feet, okay? Um, or some of these other restrictions that we're talking about. And so um, I, I wish I could provide further clarity to exactly where the treatment plan, um, the final selection is gonna be, but that is some time off and there is going to be a process to work through it. And um, you know, yes. Is there an approximate time frame that we're Oh, can you get sorry? Tom Barton, the ARD. When you say it's in the future, is there an approximate time frame you have a on mind? Okay. So, as we mentioned, uh, after a record of decision is issued, the real design can take approximately one to two years to complete uh, as an estimate. Right? And once that is done, um, we will work to secure the, the funding that's necessary to construct uh, the treatment plan. And then we we'll go through uh, the construction phase. Um, for just as a, a reference, right? at Operable Unit 1, the record of decision was issued in 2007 and the treatment plant construction was completed. It started, it started in 2000, 2010, and it began operation in 2012. Okay. Just to give you a, 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 a better handle of the overall time frame that we're looking at. Yes. yes. Smith, uh, CJ Smith. What are the electrical requirements of the plant? So that will be determined in the real design, um, how much power needs to um, 
be brought in, uh, what kind of transformers uh, need to be uh, brought in, but um, there's ample uh, electric supply uh, in the area that um, would, um, would suffice for the treatment plant. You don't so, see any new transmission lines? No, I mean, uh, so, so, yeah, for, for our program unit one, we use a three phase form and eight to one phase. So, for our program unit, if I'm expecting, our program unit one, we use a three phase four AD voltage system. It's a drop down from the existing transmission line from the street, from the Clinton Street, and it was brought into the treatment uh, where Garden City Bell stand and now we're located. So we're assuming it will be the same for this uh, three-phase 480 voltage. Coming down maybe from growth. Thank you. The other question was, has there been any failure, incident rate, pipe breakage or whatnot in your plants? Thank you. Thanks, uh, just for these sample wells. Is there a place you find the amount of chemical in each well? Yes. It's um, for the property unit two. It's in the remedial investigation report, which is available on online. And now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Remedial investigation report? Yes. Yeah. It tells you each location? It tells, it tells you, where, all, you know, the, where we drilled the well and where they're located and the results that we got from each from well. From each well? From each well, yes. I believe you have a copy of the proposed plan. Uh, on page two, our website is on the um, text box to the left. And that's where you can find all of the uh, supporting documentation um, on that link. Uh, what would they be called? Like a tech technical name? The remedial investigation report. What would the actual name well, the technical name for sample uh, one? It's different, it's different numbers, so there's 16, 17, 18. It's called a sample well? Yeah, mon monitoring well. Monitoring well, yes. Yeah. MW. MW, it's like MW16. Yeah, it has a number, there's a location. How do you find out what it says in there, though? It's gonna be, there's going to be a figure in the report that tells you the location of each of the wells. And then there'll be tables to tell you what was found in each of the well. So the website that you can find most of this information is located on that website. <coughs> Sorry, question. Uh, Mary Timmons. So I just wanted to ask a couple of things. The first thing is in the uh, Newsday article, they talk about it'll take up to two years to put this plan together, and then they talk about taking 35 years to achieve the groundwater cleanup goals. So Mr. Foxen in front of me had mentioned the water and how fast will it go you know, down with the chemicals, and then you mentioned the chemicals say above the groundwater flow, the water actually going down. So how many years are we in front of endangering the wells with the chemicals that are up above where you're testing. So, so the, the intent of what I was trying to explain before is when groundwater moves, it has a horizontal and a vertical component to it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so what I was trying to explain is that the groundwater flow of one to two feet per day is different than the rate that the contamination, the contamination is present, mm -hmm. uh, will move at. Which the, the contamination typically moves at a slower rate, and different mm -hmm. contaminants may move at different rates within itself. But the the contaminants are already in the groundwater. They're not above the groundwater, they're within the groundwater. They're within the groundwater. So with this taking 35 years to clean up, is the water that we're drinking, is it already in that and being filtered out? Or is it on its way into our drinking water? And that's what you're working to protect. So. With respect to the Garden City Wells 10 and 11, as an example, there is VOC contamination present in the raw water, and that's why there's an engineered treatment system 
that effectively uh, addresses that contamination prior to distribution um, to uh, the community. Okay, and then you talked about the um, VOCs that as you're treating it in the treatment plant, they go kind of airborne, they come out of the water and they rise above into the air as you're treating it, right? The air stripping? Into the top of the air, not into the air. Not into the, okay, so they don't actually... It, it will go into the but, you know, based on, you know, based on the levels that are coming off. Mm -hmm. And if additional treatment, if you apply, then you do that. But you know, whatever is coming off of the um, triggers <laughs> is safe to um. It's safe to those residents. Yeah. Okay, and, and I don't happen to live in that Garden Grove Street area, but I think it's imperative to be very considerate of the people that live there because I know I wouldn't want to be part of it, and I, I just think that as you enter their lives, please just be so considerate of them. Okay, thank you. That's our top priority. Yeah, couple. Sorry. I have all these questions. Um, Your name is Robert, uh, uh, Robert Foxen. Uh, will, will you be doing uh, groundwater modeling during the design phase to optimize where you put the recovery glass? Yes, we will be. Okay. And, and the other question is you mentioned that the emissions are safe. I mean, how do you know you don't But, but based on you know, what was done at Upper Unit 1, you know, there's no um, carbon treatment. So, you know, what is the what? Carbon. That was my question. How do you know you don't need activated carbon? It was, it was, it was tested. And it didn't require um, carbon. Sure, if I could just add to that. That would depend on the nature of the contamination. It might be different in one location versus another. Well, the contaminants concern for both areas is um, TC and PC. Right, yeah. but the concentrations would affect whether you need and you know that would be the term what I'm saying based on what we we had in other unit one we did we may need it for this one and that would be the term that you would know, I mean you're pretty good. close to houses I mean I put my house in that location that would make me feel a lot better I don't even know technically it might be right but that would concern me so, so if I could just add um, uh, Sherelle mentioned earlier uh, she outlined those nine evaluation criteria um, and the first was protective of human health in the environment and the second was um, compliance with, and I'll use an acronym, ARARS, because it's getting late for me, and I that, uh, say it, uh, the complete uh, term. Um, as, part of, so as part of that, we, you know, when we design and ultimately construct um, these types of treatment plans, right, we work um, with our counterparts at New York State to ensure that um, the treatment plan, any emissions from the treatment plan are in compliance with uh, the Clean Air Act, um, and discharges of the treated effluent into the recharge basin or re-injected into the ground meet um, the um, uh, Clean Water Act. And, uh, and so we ensure that we are in compliance with federal and state laws with respect to the operation of, of that treatment plan. And so um, I think what uh, Sherelle uh, was saying was that for uh, the process we went through at Operable Unit 1, uh, treatment of that air phase was not necessary at that location based on the concentrations. I believe that the concentrations of, of the contaminants, which are similar to the ones of the, the same, actually, to the ones we're treating at OU1, are at uh, generally a lower concentration in OU2 as compared to OU1. So one would expect that additional treatment of the air phase is not needed, but we will go through the process to ensure that based on the location, once it's determined, and the maximum potential concentrations of contaminants that would get treated by the plan, we are running that plan in compliance with all federal and state standards. Brandon, right, just the other thing to keep in mind in that location is it's near playgrounds. The receptors are different than the other location. Correct. And again, once we determine the location for construction of the treatment plan, we will be able to have the information determine who is in the area and how we input that information in the calculations that go into determining whether or not um, any additional treatment is warranted. Um, so it, yeah. yeah, I just want to, again, Mr. Foxen's words, is going to ask that you recognize that there's also a, uh, I think it's a K, K1 school, a kindergarten first grade school, very close to that. And I, I believe in protecting humans first. 
And if it means that it's going to cost extra to protect the units first, then put in that extra barrier of uh, you know, the, um, the charcoal, activated charcoal barrier. And uh, you know, the playgrounds, the residents, it's so close to homes, it's so close to the little school. And that's, that's it, if you could just make note of that. Any more questions? Okay. We're at the end of the meeting now. And we just want to thank each and every one of you for coming out this evening. We will um, take all of your questions into concerns. Um, they'll be part of the public record. We'll have a responsiveness summary to your questions. And then they become part of the um, regular decision that is signed by the regional administrator. If you need to send in any questions, you can email Sherelle. Let me put that slide back up. And um, they will be addressed and become part of the record, um, the responsiveness summary. You have up until March 26. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Good night.